welcome to At the Forefront FinTech Conversations. I'm Michael Kingsley. I'm a Senior Vice President at Forefront Communications. And today I'm speaking with Brandon Mulvihill and Anthony Mazaris of Crossover Markets. Hey guys, how are you? Doing well. Pleasure to be here. Great yeah, to see likewise. you. Great to see you. Brandon is co-founder and CEO, and Anthony is co-founder and chief commercial officer. Thanks again for joining us. So let's jump right into it. You guys founded Crossover in 2022 and launched the CrossX venue in March. But both of you had spent your careers to that point largely in FX and not crypto. So I wanted to start by talking about what lessons the FX industry has for today's cryptocurrency trading, and then how that led you guys to the creation of Crossover and CrossX. Sure. Uh, yeah, Brandon, why don't you jump in? Yeah, happy to. So I think that um, probably the story to, that, that's central um, to looking at this question is really the history of execution models between uh, a central limit order book, um, which the acronym is referred to as a CLOB. So again, central limit order book, people often say CLOB, uh, and that of an ECN model. And, you know, Anthony and I are both 20 year veterans in foreign exchange. And when you look at the FX market, um, you know, historically there were companies, EBS uh, and Thomson Reuters that, uh, uh, that offered a, a central limit order book or a CLOB execution model uh, and really were at the forefront of the early days of electronic execution in the space. Now, as time went on, there were players, names like Kernex, names like Hotspot, names like Fastmatch, and a whole host of others that came into the space with an ECN model. Uh, and without, I'm sure later on this podcast, we'll get into some of the nuances and the differences. But the point is, is that the ECN model ultimately delivered a tighter price with deeper pools of liquidity uh, to consumers. And so it was a very, very disruptive execution model in the space. Now, for Anthony and I, uh, probably our story goes back somewhere uh, along the lines of we started in around 2018 in, in terms of seriously looking at crypto. Uh, and from that point uh, to the point of inception when we founded Crossover, one of the key themes that we were just excited about was this reality that almost every execution venue in crypto today operates a central limit order book model, right? And so the idea that there were no ECNs, the, in, in, the, in the idea that there weren't a dozen of them mm -hmm. or, uh, got us quite excited and, and made us realize that there is a huge opportunity for disruption and experience that we think we can bring to the market that is, uh, is favorable to the consumer. So I think that's interesting that you, you know, you're looking at what works and taking that experience, but actually going in a, a very different direction from the way things had traditionally been done. Uh, Anthony, you want to pick up on that a little bit? Yeah, I, I, I echo exactly what uh, what Brandon said. Um, institutional clients, whether it's foreign exchange, equities, crypto, they're they're seeking out best best execution and low costs and. Um, having different ways to interact over a venue is important. And there's, there's a place for a central limit order book and there's, there's certainly a place for an ECN. So, um, you know, we're, we're excited to, to have launched our business and, and really bring something different to, to institutional clients. Great. Okay, cool. So let's, let's follow that thread a little bit and tell us about your ECN and, and, and how it works and how it is different from what's come before. Sure. So, I, the, you know, the way that Anthony and I kind of address this, this question um, is, first, is as a compare and contrast to the CLOB execution model. So to just to go back one step, when you look at a CLOB, a CLOB is effectively, uh, there is one market data session, and there is one, for lack of a better phrase, swimming pool of liquidity. And so it doesn't matter if uh, the venue offering the club has 10 clients or has a thousand clients. All of those clients are interacting with the same market data session. They're all training into uh, one pool of liquidity. Uh, through an ECN execution model and what we've deployed in CrossX, our flagship, uh, flagship product, it is a model whereby if we bring 50 institutions who are takers of liquidity, okay, we are creating 50 independent market data sessions. 
And those takers of liquidity are accessing 50 independent pools of liquidity. Now, the reason that this is important, and there are several reasons why this is important, is firstly, from the viewpoint of the taker consumer of the liquidity, the, inter the liquidity they're interacting with is truly unique to them, such that if user 10 behaves in a certain way, their behavior does not adversely impact the other 49 users uh, of the system. Uh, conversely, Michael, if you look at it through the lens of a market maker who's making a price on cross-sex through an ECN model, that market maker isn't making a binary decision about do they price cross-sex or not. That market maker is certainly pricing cross-sex, and they get to have the decision of do they want to interact with all 50 users. Mm -hmm. They also have a secondary piece of uh, decision-making uh, that allows them to say, if we do want to interact with all or some uh, of those users on the system, uh, do we want to customize or tailor our price to that taker uh, of liquidity? Mm -hmm. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, kind of go on one tangent for a minute because I think it's applicable. Generally speaking, uh, uh, electronic trading and, and certainly market makers are very interested in behavioral characteristics, okay. right? And so the more in the data age that we live in, it's no different in trading. The more data you have, the better. And the more reliable data that you have, the better, right? And so if your data is very reliable and based on yesterday and today's activity, you can reasonably make an assumption about tomorrow's activity then as a market maker, you feel very confident in your willingness to, to price uh, consistently and aggressively to that consumer. What an ECN model does is deliver that layer of predictability mm -hmm. as the market maker is interacting with specific identifiers and through time gets to learn those behaviors mm -hmm. and price it accordingly. And this is just uh, opposite, again, to the CLAW model where every single trade in the club, the next trade might come from a retail broker who has an underlying retail client. The tr trade after might come from a high frequency trading strategy. Mm -hmm. And the point is, is in a club, what becomes very difficult is that yesterday's activity and today's behavior don't necessarily translate to an accurate prediction for what happens tomorrow. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting. You're, you're putting me in the mind this this idea of it's customizable. It's a unique experience. It's tailored to the individual client, the individual participant. Puts me in mind of other parts of your value prop, of course, right? One that it's execution only, so that you're focused just on that. But also, it, it there's some similar DNA to your decoupling trade execution from custody and brokerage, also in that you're giving choice to the participants really customizing their experience, allowing them to customize it themselves, exactly how they trade and with whom and who they interact and who the other parties are. Can you talk about that a little bit about the decoupling trade execution from uh, brokerage and custody? Yeah, I, I, I could jump in there. So um, this is a really important point. And so for, especially institutional clients, I, I touched on it before, but in order for them to receive best execution, they really need to have the ability to trade across multiple venues, across multiple counterparties, and not be captive to, to one, one venue, one exchange, or one counterparty. Um, and the way that that occurs is basically fungibility between venues or, or brokers. Um, so because we're execution only, we, we're not counterparty to the client trade. We don't hold client money. We don't actually touch coin. We're really just that execution venue. And the client has the ability to prime broke or custody or broke with whomever they like. Um, so we're agnostic to, to credit counterparty. But we believe because of this, clients now have the ability to trade across venue and trade with other venues and other counterparties. And, and that should ultimately lead to lower spreads or lower cost of execution. It should lead to better price discovery and ultimately uh, less balance sheet usage because they're not having to fund all of these different venues. So we think that the, the execution only piece of our business is, is really critical. And we think that the market is moving in this direction because it's, um, 
it's how it operates in, in traditional markets. And we believe that that's how it really should operate in crypto. That's great. And, and I wanted to, you know, follow up a little bit more there as we're talking, you know, what makes you guys, you basically what makes the, the, the platform, what it is. Um, can you talk a little bit on the tech side uh, about building an institutional crypto ECN, like what goes into it? And this is where you're going to want to talk about Vlad, who's a, a, another partner who's not represented here today and, and what he uniquely brings to the effort. Sure. So, you know, um, again, let's take some steps back and, and, and look at this through more of a historical lens. So, uh, we, you know, when Anthony and I were, were looking at the industry, another piece that really jumped out at us was the fact that 24-7, 365 trading is not a differentiator. It, it's, it's simply a mandate. It is a minimum threshold to enter the space. And, and that's interesting because if you brought 24-7, 365 trading to any other financial market, it would be totally disruptive. It, it would be the biggest conversation uh, that would happen in any given year. Um, and so the, the genesis of crossover, crossover was how do we go and find the right partner to come in to build uh, our crypto venue uh, with a foundation that is, uh, uh, has an eye to the crypto needs to start with, uh, but who also has you know, someone who has a, a team with the expertise to bring in knowledge from equities and foreign exchange namely in the way of order logic uh, into the crypto market, which we thought was severely lacking. So, um, so Vlad Ryzen is a guy that I personally have known for uh, roughly a decade and, and, and Anthony has met on and off uh, through that time as well. And what makes Vlad's story interesting and, and the story of his team is that Vlad has been in financial markets for 35 years. Um, and one of the unique things about him is that he started his career for 20 years in equities, okay? And so he was an equities guy. And through our experience, typically people are in equities or they are in foreign exchange. Very rarely are they in both. And 10 years ago, Vlad uh, went to a, a, a young startup in an enterprise called Fastmatch where he was the CTO. Uh, and he helped uh, and his team develop that technology. And so they built uh, what is today still the fastest and, and arguably the most advanced FX ECN in the world. And FastMatch was later sold to Euronext. And so when we think about, you know, what does it take to build a, a, a crypto venue? What we really think it, it, it takes first and foremost is a, a very unique individual and a mm -hmm. unique skill set. Um, from a team who can both, you know, think of it in, in better terms as you need someone who understands Rosetta Stone. You need someone who can actually speak the language of crypto, speak the language of equities, speak the language of foreign exchange to try to extract the best from all these asset classes and then deliver it in a really clean way uh, to the market. So that's a pretty high level uh, mm -hmm. view on it. You know, Anthony, I don't know if you'd want to touch on one or two uh, uh, further elements on this topic about some of the more uh, micro elements to the to the tag. Um, look, well, I think I think what I would add here, and I think this is is important. Um, Vlad and his, Vlad is an amazing technologist, and we believe the best in the business. But you know, he's he's a he's a good person, uh, he's, and he's a great partner. So you know, it's it's been uh, we, we founded the company a year ago. And, uh, you know, like any startup, there's, there's stressful times and there's, uh, and there's fun times. And, you know, we've been fortunate that, that the fun times outweighed the, the stressful times. And it's been, uh, you know, it, it's been a nice partnership for, for the past year. And we're really excited about kind of where things lead. So um, I guess that's what I would add on, on, on Vlad and the team. Yeah, it sounds like you guys really have the, the right team in place to make this happen for sure. Um, now, I, I think everybody listening has a good sense of the different personalities uh, between retail and institutional crypto investors. I think they can form pictures in their mind of who's who's on what side of things. Uh, but I wanted to ask specifically about the needs of a retail crypto investor versus institutional. You've built this network for institutional crypto investors. How are their needs different than the needs of a retail crypto investor? Yeah, great question. So... 
Um, for, for a retail client, it, it's whether you're trading equities or foreign exchange or crypto, retail clients like to have sort of that bundled service where you can go to open an account at Charles Schwab, you deposit money, you trade stocks. It's very simple. You see your account balance, you see your daily PL, you open the position, you close the position. It's all, it's all in one place. It's easy. And that's and that works really well for retail. Uh, for institutional clients, it's a little bit different, obviously, because the, the, these components of what a Charles Schwab or Coinbase offer, these in the institutional market tend to be different components serviced by different companies. Um, so institutional clients, they have rules and um, preferences on where they custody assets, whether that's dollars or that's Bitcoin. So, you know, they're, they're, they're going to flock to, they're, they're, they have a requirement to keep their assets with counterparties that they are approved and comfortable with. Um, and those counterparties tend to be different from the counterparties that they look to execute with. So these are all different services um, and the institutional market, it's, it's really important that they have the ability, and, and I've, I've said this before, and it's, it really is important, but they, they have the ability to trade across different venues and across different counterparties mm -hmm. and sort of net settle that activity. Um, because trading with just a sole counterparty and being captive to one provider it isn't, isn't something that they're used to in other markets. So that, that's really the big difference between retail and institutional. Uh, uh, one other point I would add is retail clients, uh, obviously the, the UI, the, the GUI, the, the trading platform experience is really important, right? Mm -hmm. Charts and all of the bells and whistles on a platform. And, and that's, that's what retail clients like. For institutional clients, again, these are different components. So they're more focused on the API and having access to liquidity that's ultra low latency and super high throughput. Um, and really the technology behind that mm -hmm. sort of GUI is, is what, they're, what they're connecting to. And, and the GUI is something that they would either outsource from a different vendor or they build mm -hmm. on their own. But we're really focused on the technology that connects directly to institutional clients. And that's, um, that's important for, for institutions. Yeah, I mean, everything you said there matches up with everything you've said on the podcast so far about the custom customizable, uh, the customizable nature of it. Uh, the, the, it's tailored to each uh, to each firm and so on. Having that ability uh, to do it, and what's interesting is, you know, it goes beyond just being clicking the button for expert settings when you're setting up an app. There's just so much more behind it in terms of. Uh, compliance and regulatory issues and shareholders and all of those things that are that are behind it. Um, Brandon, did you have anything to add to that? Um, the only thing I would add to, to, to what Anthony said is just more um, in terms of our experience uh, in the financial markets, I think it's noteworthy that Anthony and I come from a retail background. Uh, we also built uh, institutional businesses uh, at this point many times over. And so uh, why we're uh, crossover and cross X uh, specifically are aimed at institutions uh, as our cap table uh, represents where we have five regulated retail brokers who are also investors into crossover. Um, it is important, I, I, I think to state that while we don't take retail clients directly, we mm -hmm. do work with retail brokers uh, and, it, and it is a big segment and a big area of expertise for us. Absolutely. Um, all right. So I want to ask you to sort of put your hat on here and pretend you're uh, an institutional investor. And this is the kind of news you can use uh, segment here is, is you guys are not obviously not the only venue out there. So if you were an institutional investor uh, or market participant in one form or fashion, what questions should these folks be asking themselves when they're selecting a venue? Sure. So two, two come to mind right off the the top of my head. Um, so the first one is going to make us sound a little bit like a broken record. Um, so I'll try to kind of give a few more bullet points to this theme of the decoupling of execution and uh, in clearing in custody. Um, from the vantage point of, you know, I think the first question, if you're an institution is, is the venue that you're trading with also the custodian? Is it also the clear? Put a different way, is the venue that you're trading with holding you captive? Meaning, if you buy Bitcoin with that venue, are you obliged to sell Bitcoin 
with that venue? Because if the answer there is yes, how good does that technology really have to be? Because by virtue of placing one trade, that venue is guaranteed two trades, right? And, and, and so with us, what CrossX does, as Anthony already explained, is it champions the idea of a fungible environment. And, and so we are competing for one leg of the trade, which is to say we are competing every second of every day, right? And so there is a very strong correlation between technology and the, the capacity of technology and whether or not it's holding a client captive. If a client is, if a venue is holding you captive, it's fairly likely that tech is going to be slower, is not going to have the same throughput. And if someone is operating the way we are, if the answer is no, that venue is not holding you captive, then you at least tick the first box that that venue is doing something to prove to you that they need to win your business every second of every mm -hmm. day. And what happened yesterday doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen today in terms of winning market share. Um, you know, I think the second thing that that we that you would want to ask the venue is, um, what is the level of customization? Uh, in terms of execution style, hmm. right? And, and I, so we've talked a little bit about the, the fact that CrossX can scale. We've talked a little bit about the fact that CrossX uh, provides custom uh, liquidity pools and market data. But through the lens of the institution, when they're looking at different venues, there's some other questions to be, to be asked. So for example, one thing that comes up is the idea of last look versus firm liquidity. This is a hot debate in equities. It's a hot debate in foreign exchange. It's going to be a pretty hot debate in cryptocurrency trading. And you know what we would say is what our venue allows for is for the taker consumer of liquidity to dictate how they want to interact with liquidity. Our takers can mm -hmm. come up to CrossX and say, I only want firm liquidity. Or they can come in and they can say, uh, I want my makers to offer last look and have the ability to reject a trade because I think it gives me this experience that is better for my needs. Um, and for us uh, at Crossover, this is really important because the ability to actually deliver this is not trivial. It, mm -hmm. it, this, is a, this is a monumental uh, technical feat. It's very difficult to deliver. And so... Uh, lots of companies or lots of venues out there, if an institution goes and says to that company, hey, can you provide either of these execution styles, for example, uh, the reality is the venue cannot, and they go into a mm -hmm. bit of a marketing pitch, and they go into a bit of a sales pitch. Uh, they want to play, they want to claim the moral high ground. They want to have a view on maybe uh, last look is better, or maybe mm -hmm. no last look is, is better. And I just think for us being agnostic uh, to the client's counterparty, being agnostic to the client's custodian, uh, uh, it's also true that we're agnostic to the client's style of how they want to interact uh, with liquidity. And so I think that's another question for someone to ask is, do you support both last look and non-last non -last look, uh, mm -hmm. non look liquidity because if the answer is yes, that's another really good sign that the venue you're dealing with uh, has a very, very high degree of technical uh, uh, capacity. Okay, absolutely. Um, yeah, no, I, I think it's it, the, it's always a good way to phrase it, right? Questions you should be asking yourself when you're considering these things. And, and I appreciate that you you made the connective tissue with the stuff we've talked about before, but at the same time, you you added some additional dimensions to it because there are so many different considerations, absolutely. So you guys launched last year, uh, went live a month before last. What is next? What's the future for Crossover? Yeah, there's a lot. Uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> we can keep going. Give, I, give us, give us a couple. Yeah, yeah, give us, give us a couple of things. Sure. Yeah, sure. So I, I think first of all, at a high level, we have um, a number of partnerships uh, and uh, some very high level client relationships. We'll be announcing uh, in the fall. Um, we have a num number of technology enhancements in terms of order types. 
uh, things like uh, I'll give I'll give one teaser uh, peg to mid order types um, and various versions that fall off of peg to mid uh, will be things that we'll be talking about in the fall. There's a number of things that we're doing technically um, and uh, that we're not announcing or discussing right now widely just to keep our our messaging quite narrow and focused. But as we get into the fall and, and into the winter into Q4, there'll be a lot more uh, announcements on that. Um, another teaser I think that we're comfortable giving out right now is uh, it's clear, I, I hope it's clear to everyone listening that speed and throughput and, and technical capacity is the forefront of what we do. It's what we think about every second of every day. Um, uh, we are talking about executing trades in sub 20 microseconds. Um, and because that's a number we're, we're comfortable um, stating to folks, we are experiencing uh, execution times right now that are much faster than that. Uh, we have throughput capability of millions of trades per second. Um, and so, and the way that clients access uh, our system in terms of the gateway, uh, it's a protocol, a very well-known protocol fix. So this is fairly straightforward, at least in financial and traditional financial markets and crypto less so. Uh, but one teaser we can give is that uh, as we enter next year, we will be launching a binary protocol, which is simply a, uh, an additional gateway for how folks can access our system. Uh, and, and the summary of the binary protocol is to continue to uh, uh, increase the capacity of throughput and decrease the execution time so that we're always at the forefront of speed and throughput in the industry. That's great. So I've got, I've got uh, more speed. I've got new partnerships. I've got new order types and new technology. So it's uh, going to be an exciting year for you guys, for sure. Um, and listen, I want to thank you guys for talking to us today, Brandon and Anthony. Thank you very much for taking the time to do this. It was really interesting. Um, to the listeners, if you want to learn more about Crossover and viewers, uh, you can visit their website at crossovermarkets.com. If you'd like to learn more about Forefront, uh, you can visit us at ForefrontComs, that's C-O-M-M-S dot com. Uh, thanks again to Brandon and Anthony, and thanks very much to all of you for watching and listening.